Good morning, welcome to Dublin Vineyard Online Church Service. Those of you who've been part of our community since we started way back in the 90s, welcome those of you who've become part of our community during COVID, you're really, really welcome. And who we are is we're a community of people gathered around a transforming presence, a transforming friendship, a transforming person of Jesus. And he transforms us as we enter into an apprenticeship relationship with him, if you like, as a community and as individuals. So just to let you know what's going to happen in our service today, already this morning our kids ministry team have been uh, doing Kids Church online with uh, the children in our community and you guys who've been doing it for so long, well done, thank you for doing that and pointing our kids to Jesus. What a great way to invest some of your time and your energy helping our kids discover Jesus. That's so well done, thank you for doing that. Our service then will start with some worship and after our worship we'll have uh, just a short announcement about the how we're going to uh, return to in-person services. I'll give you an update on that. And then Helen will begin preaching out of one of Paul's prayers, continuing a second segment of that, Helen this week and Lee Ann next week. Then after our um, Helen sermon, there will be some more worship and I'll be back again just to close us up. And actually we'll have ministry time at the end of our service through a Zoom link that's appearing in the chat box right now. So uh, you can follow that link and after the service there will be uh, ministry or just if you seek God's blessing, that will be available to you. But right now, let's pray, let's welcome the presence of the Lord and turn our hearts and our minds to Him. Lord Jesus, you are in all these places and that's what makes us one united together would you take everything that we do fill it with your power and your presence and let it be for your glory amen when i call your name you answer when i fall you are there by my side you delivered me out of darkness now i stand in the hope of new life by grace and free you rescued me
Your perfect love is casting a fear And even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life I won't turn back, I know you are near And I will fear no evil For my God is with me And if my God is with me Whom then shall I fear? Whom then shall I So I just want to give you a quick update on where we are on returning to in-person services. We are planning to return to in-person services on the second weekend in July. And thank you for all of you who volunteered to help make that happen. Lawrence has been in touch with you and will be in touch with you about ensuring that we follow the appropriate return to in-person service protocols related to COVID. But we're going for the second weekend in July and we're really looking forward to that. Please be praying that it all goes well and it continues and we will continue to make steps to returning to the way we were before COVID. So the second weekend in July. Hello church family, happy Sunday. My name is Helen. I'm a member of the preaching team here at Dublin Vineyard. Two years ago, if I were doing this, I would probably have been standing in front of all of you at the Y on Angel Street. 
Instead, I'm talking to you through a camera. We are meeting like this for now because of the hand that has been dealt to us by COVID-19. But I think we have reached a point where there's a tiny light at the end of the tunnel and there's a glimmer of hope that we will be reunited again under one roof when it is safer to do so. And while things haven't been the way they were before with regards to being able to be around people physically, I think that most people have had to be a bit more intentional about interacting with others. I know that personally, I have spoken to my siblings and friends a lot more on the phone than I ever did. I never thought I'd see the day that my elderly parents would be video calling me consistently or asking for a family Zoom call to be organized. Many grandparents like my parents have had to learn how to go from single index finger texting to learning how to use WhatsApp for video calls and so on. And many workplaces like mine have also experienced a pandemic of Microsoft Teams meetings, <sighs> webinars, seminars, and so on. And remember that time when everyone was organizing a Zoom game night? I think I'm actually a little happy to be out of that phase now. But one of such interactions that I do love is our online church. I love the chat box. I love logging on on a Sunday morning and seeing everyone say hi and happy Sunday. I love the very brief essential chats about the weather. <laughs> I love it when new, new joiners introduce themselves. I, I love that there's usually a host who would say hello to everyone. And I really love that during the sermon, people would send in quotes or passages or parts of the sermon that resonated with them. Those emphasized messages can also resonate with others. And if you think about it, we probably wouldn't have had that level of intimacy previously. But mostly, I think I am thankful and proud of how the church leaders have worked so hard to keep this going and how we're all still showing up. Everyone has had to adjust with the world in order to supply that need for community and interaction. At the core of this is the fact that as people, we need each other. It is in our human nature to want to feel connected to others. If you think about how we all felt at the beginning of the pandemic, the anxiety and the fear of the unknown, of whether we'd be able to see each other again or hug each other again, not knowing why or how or when brought a deep sense of doom or darkness. This scenario reminds me of some of the situations that the early Christians had to endure after the resurrection of Christ. The world was definitely a lot more uncivilized then, and Christians were seen as rebellious, so they were very much persecuted by the Romans and Jews alike. Despite that, the disciples went ahead um, with their purpose of spreading the message of Jesus Christ across the Middle East, Asia, the Mediterranean, and North Africa. The Apostle Paul was so instrumental in planting these churches alongside Silas and Timothy. But even after they had moved on, they would still send back letters to those churches to pray for them, to give them advice, to reprimand them in areas that they needed to improve upon, and to encourage them to hold on to their faith. One of these churches was the church in Thessalonica. So just for some background, the church in Thessalonica was in Macedonia, which is modern day Greece. Paul had spent some time there preaching in the, in the Jewish synagogues from the scriptures and trying to convince people to follow the teachings of Christ because he is the Messiah. A large number of people were converted, but some Jews got jealous, formed a mob, started a riot and an uprising and forced them out of the city. But after he left, he wrote two letters to the members of that church who had been persecuted because of their faith. Paul had received reports on how they were getting on. A lot of them were Gentiles or non-Jews who were pers persevering through very difficult circumstances. So I'm going to read from Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, chapter three, verse 10 to 13. Paul writes, night and day, we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. 
May the Lord make you love, make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your heart so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. This passage spoke to me because Paul understood what difficult circumstances can do to one's faith and how these difficult circumstances can affect your core beliefs. He says that he's praying for them so that he may see them again, so he can supply what is lacking in their faith. The New Living Translation of the text describes this as filling the gaps in their faith. So let's talk a little about some things that lead to the lack of faith or gaps in faith. There's a wide range, but I'm going to focus on one very broad term, and that is stress. Stress is a widely used term. There's a broad range of things that could cause stress. And stress means different things to different people at different stages of life. People also have different reactions to stress. Some people thrive on stress and get a jolt of adrenaline when they are stressed. But even that can be an issue and subsequently it becomes unhealthy. But other people like me get crippled or paralyzed by stress. And because it is a subjective term, there's so many categories of stress. Stress could be physical, it could be psychological, psychosocial stress, or psychospiritual stress. Physical stresses like illness or injury, psychological stresses like anxiety, depression, grief, anger. Psychosocial stresses could be things like financial issues, homelessness, unemployment, divorce, death of a loved one and then the category that i'm going to focus on today is psycho spiritual stress so the definition of psycho spiritual stress is a crisis of values meaning and purpose joyless striving instead of productive satisfying satisfying meaningful and fulfilling work and a misalignment with one's core spiritual beliefs so usually when the word psycho is used, people will get thrown off because it is usually used incorrectly and synonymously with craziness. But the origin of the word is from the Greek term psyche, which means the soul, mind and spirit, the invisible and unconscious entity which occupies and directs the physical body. It is your way of thinking. So psychospiritual is just another way or a term to describe your thinking about your spirituality. Physical, psychological and psychosocial stress can ultimately lead to stress in your spiritual thinking. And that is because stresses can turn peace into chaos, closeness into distance, passion into numbness. They can disrupt comfort with very uncomfortable life events. And ultimately, they can turn your conviction, your faith, your love of God and belief in Christ into doubt. And this is what Paul is talking about. It is not easy to have joy and be filled with confidence in God when things are not good. Like when you're extremely busy or tired or, feeling, or not feeling motivated. Talk less of when the stressors are dialed up. It is definitely not easy to have good spiritual thinking when you're worried or scared or angry, when you're ill or hurt or disappointed in others or in yourself. And especially when you've sinned and you feel guilty. Trials have a way of draining faith and misaligning you with your core beliefs. These stresses have a way of pushing you further away from your best self and pushing you to the end of your rope. Ironically, that place, the end of your rope, is what someone described as God's address. That is the place where you find God. That place of feeling overwhelmed, of hardship, the end of the rope is where Paul heard God. 
he heard God say, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power or my presence is made perfect in your weakness or in your trials when you are stressed and at the end of your rope. So in the text from Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, he knows that the members of the church are having to live through some of these stressors. And he acknowledges the situation of persecution that they had to endure, which in turn could lead to a lack of faith or gaps in faith. So he then decides to pray for them. Paul had a way of writing where he'd acknowledge a problem, pray for or against it, and then provide them with a prayer or expectation or promise of what he envisions for them. In the case of the Thessalonians, Maybe if Paul were there with them, they would have been in a better place that would encourage them or restore their faith. That's a very comfortable situation. Kind of like having to go to church every Sunday, the strength in numbers, right? Being able to have a supportive supportive group to talk to or get prayer, an encouraging Bible verse or advice, or even a comforting hug or tap on the shoulder. You know, those things that make hard times easier to bear or deal with. What's that saying? Um, Sharing is caring. So that's what Paul was praying, that God would make a way for, for him to be able to see them again, to bring them back to a place of comfort. But in the meantime, through the trials and through the stresses, what happens? What Paul recommends here is not the typical remedy for trials. You would expect him to give practical solutions like fight back your oppressors or negotiate with them or even run away and leave everything. Go to a safer place or a haven where there'll be no persecution. No, he doesn't do that. Instead, he prays this in verse 12, that the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else just as ours does for you. Paul prays for a love that increases and overflows. This is the opposite of an eye for an eye. And he's definitely not encouraging the Thessalonians to go into a state of hiding or protection. Paul is saying that even in those situations that are stressful and hard and overwhelming, when your spiritual thinking and confidence in God is affected, He's praying for an increase in love amongst the believers in Thessalonica and everyone else. Yes, even their persecutors and stressors. That's tough, isn't it? To love something or someone who caused you pain or disappointment. For example, I would be thinking, am I supposed to forgive that friend who hurt me? Is Paul asking me to live in love and positivity when I haven't been able to see my family in over a year and a half? Or knowing that people that I care about have lost a dear one or a job are suffering. How are we supposed to love people who persecute us for believing in Christ? It is at this point that we need to apply the teachings of the Sermon on the Mount. Remember in Matthew chapter 5 verse 10 to 12, Jesus says, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evils against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. Well, that is it lived out in real life. The Sermon on the Mount is for real life, to be lived out in real life with all its stresses, setbacks, and challenges. The Sermon on the Mount is simply how Jesus would have lived life if he were me. There's a verse from Zechariah chapter 4 verse 6 that I always think about whenever I feel like God is trying to push me to act beyond my humanly self, beyond my strong personality, my anger, and my hurt. And that is not by power, nor by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. And that is because the truth is that if we were to depend on ourselves and the humanly way in which we love, which is conditionally, 
we could never push past our own stresses and difficult situations and selfish desires to love like Jesus would want us to. We just can't do it. Not without the Holy Spirit. The Christian life isn't about doing what is humanly possible. At the end of your humanly rope, your humanly thinking and your human capabilities is a door into a new way of living that Jesus is inviting us into. So Paul prays in verse 13, may he strengthen your heart so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and our Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. To live and love like Christ requires strength that we do not have. And that is why this prayer is significant. This verse also ties in directly to the message of love that Jesus preached from the Sermon on the Mount. Sean reminded us of this a few weeks ago. I'll read that passage again to remind us again of what Jesus says about love in Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 to 48. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are you not you are not even the tax collectors doing that. And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. So in both passages, from Paul's letter to the Thessalonians and Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, it is clear that God honors that kind of love that goes beyond ourselves, beyond the familiar, beyond the comfortable, especially when it is uncomfortable. We should believe Jesus when he says that we should rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. God's promise is that there is healing and glory and reward in love. There is healing and glory and reward in service. There's healing and glory and reward in sharing, in community, in generosity, in forgiveness, even when it doesn't feel the best. Even when you don't want to get out of bed. Even with someone that you feel is undeser undeserving of your sorry, your thank you or your effort. C.S. Lewis says, to love at all is to be vulnerable. The great thing to remember is that though our feelings come and go, God's love for us does not. You cannot love a fellow creature fully till you love God. Love is not an affectionate feeling, but a steady wish for the loved person's ultimate good as far as it can be obtained. When I was preparing for this, I got a clear image of a tethered love in multiple directions and dimensions. And I hope you can remind yourselves of this through trials. So remind yourself of one, God's abundant love for us that is omnipotent and omnipresent. Two, remind yourself of our love of him through an intentional and nurtured relationship, through prayer and spending time in the word. And then three, the bits that we all struggle with is the ability and the strength to love like him through the gift of the Holy Spirit to love infinitely and beyond the comfortable and the familiar. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. You know what? That is who we are. That is what it means to be Christ-like. We love and have faith beyond the physical, beyond what the eyes can see, beyond what seems rational or irrational during the good and most especially through the trials when we need to push through to love and have faith so that we can as paul says be blameless 
and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. You know, there's a huge overlap between the Sermon on the Mount and this prayer for the Thessalonians. And there's a reason for that. The Thessalonians were living out the Sermon on the Mount just like we all do today. So while we may not be beaten or imprisoned for our faith like we were, we do experience difficult situations where, as children of God, we are called to display God's likeness in our everyday life, at work, at home, in friendships, in marriages, and even with strangers. And we do experience situations that affect our spiritual thinking. When we are stressed, when we are sad and worried, and at the end of our rope. We are called to remember the Father's love. We are called to be Christ-like, to forgive, to show compassion and show agape love to all, even those who hurt us. It would seem that becoming that kind of person Jesus is, is unavoidable for his followers. So today, allow him to show you one area of your life or a difficult situation where With his power, you can be the kind of person Jesus would be if he were in your situation. So I'll end with a quote. And I always think about this when I'm going through a tough time. So I just thought I'd share it with you. The quote says, It is in the quiet crucible of your personal private sufferings that your noblest dreams are born and God's greatest gifts are given in compensation for what you've been through. I'll read that again. It is in the quiet crucible of your personal private sufferings that your noblest dreams are born and God's greatest gifts are given in compensation for what you've been through. Let me just pray for all of us because this is a tough one. It's tough to live beyond your humanly self. It's tough to love when you are going through difficult situations. So I just pray, Lord, that you touch the hearts of everyone who's here listening today. May you increase your love within us. May it overflow. Give us the strength to overcome through the Holy Spirit. Give us the strength to love like you. It is the only way. It is the only way. Amen. Amen.
So we've come to the end of our service. Hopefully you encountered Jesus in our service. If you would like prayer for anything or just a blessing, if you could uh, follow the link now that's appearing in the chat box to a, a Zoom breakout room and there'll be people who are trained to pray for you and they'd love the opportunity to do that. We will be doing communion next week. So make sure in advance to have your uh, whatever you use for bread and wine uh, next week. And let me just pray a final blessing over us all. Lord God, you are the God who blesses. You are the God who gives of yourself and calls yourself our shepherd. Would you help us to lean into you the way sheep lean into a shepherd? That we get care and protection and provision from our shepherd. Amen. Have a great week, folks.